There are surveys that have been done which blind survey people to say, give me 10 words that describe a man. Give me 10 words that describe a woman. Give me 10 words that describe a strong leader. What overlap do you think there is between the male characteristics and the strong leadership characteristics? About 80 to 90%. Strong leader, female characteristics, maybe 10%. And so we have a model in our heads as people. we are just grown up with a view of what strong leadership is, looks like, feels, feels good. It doesn't match some of those more natural characteristics of, of the female side of us. So getting feedback on how far out you are from those tram lines as a female leader is essential. And it's tough. Because when you see women being talked about in business as the queen bee, the alpha male in a skirt, the rude word that begins with a B, it's because she's strayed over what is seen to be an acceptable line, but she's doing what she believes strong leadership requires. Tough, decisive, affirmative action. Getting on with the business. But not remembering that we expect a somewhat feminine side to them to be kept in there as well. And on the other hand, if you get what I got, which was Whoa, way too soft, too collaborative, no decisions are made, ineffective, we've gone too far over the other side. So the double bind requires you, as a female leader, to be aware of it, to get feedback on it, and to get constant feedback from people you trust to say, am I within the tram lines or am I outside of them? The other thing on impact that I've learned is communication style. That's everything to do with how we communicate. Of course, it's about body language, but voice is incredibly important for a woman leader, particularly in a very male-dominated environment, to understand how her voice is heard or not heard. Now, I don't know about you, but I have asked other female leaders, have they ever had the experience of sitting in a meeting? They may be the only woman in the room. They think of a contribution, a point to make, and they think, and they think, and they think. They try to work out how to express it effectively to be heard. And lo and behold, that so-and-so over there, who's a bloke, just comes in and says exactly what you were thinking. Once again, you're in the meeting, you've made no contribution. It is really frustrating. The second thing we do is we make a contribution, nobody acknowledges it, five minutes later a bloke makes the same contribution, they all go, what a brilliant suggestion. <laughs> that is so frustrating. <laughs> and it's about the way in which we're putting our point across. It's about the words we use, the language we use, our tone of voice, and staying calm and low, and not allowing ourselves to get high-pitched. And it's so frustrating, but it is a reality. So impact and communication and women understanding language to use. Don't apologize for a contribution. Make it decisively. I think Brian says, say what you mean, mean what you say, and be succinct. Those are two areas, and the third is around visibility. I have heard so many women say, I loathe networking, hate networking. But you know, it's not good enough to just do a good job for male and female in an organisation. You have to be visible, you have to be noticed. And there are very natural, informal networks and gatherings that happen in business because of common interests, common points, common topics of conversation. If you are in a minority, and I'm specifically talking about one minority here today, which is gender, and you're not in the informal club, you don't forge the relationships that are useful to you to progress and to be visible. So you have to think of alternative strategies to networking and to become visible in an organization. And coaches and mentors can be absolutely essential in helping people consciously think about how to substitute for the informal network and the informal power groups and how to maintain relationships with people over the years and not ignore people such that you know, when my boss got into a job where he was promoted into a part of the world I wanted to work in and a job I wanted, I picked up the phone to congratulate him. He it reminded him I existed. He offered me a job. If you don't manage those relationships and think about it consciously as an informal network to build, 
then don't be surprised when you don't get noticed and you get passed over, which is what I say to the women. This is all about the woman as an individual. And you talk about transforming business for good on a permanent basis. Over 30 years, I have seen so many initiatives to help women cure themselves of these dreadful issues and diseases that we have, which is about being feminine. <laughs> However, without sustainable change on the other side of the equation, which is within the organisation and the leadership of the organisations within which those women want to succeed and thrive, you will not see, we will not see breakthrough in terms of gender representation. So the conversation for me, when I talk to CEOs, is absolutely support women in these developmental exercises and programs. Absolutely put flexible programs in place, logistics for childcare, flexible working, bringing people back from maternity leave. But you also have to act. And so my advice for CEOs and organisations is, first of all, measure it. If you're serious about this as a CEO, show your commitment by putting measurements in place. Measurements symbolise what is important in an organisation, as, as you all know. It doesn't have to be about quotas, but if you at least measure how many women you're bringing in at graduate level, how many women you're hiring, how many women you're appraising at a high level, how many are promoted and how many get through to a senior role, it puts the issue on the table. It gives transparency to it and it gives meaning to it because it means you are bothered about this as an issue. So measurement is the first thing. The second thing is to understand those issues I said about visibility, about networking, about sponsorship. You have to put proactive plans in place to substitute for the fact that those things just don't happen in and of themselves on a large enough scale. So think about making all the senior executives in an organisation become formal sponsors for at least one, if not more than one, woman with potential and talent. Measure it. You might even consider incentivising them on it to the point where when you have candidates and pipelines come through, there's always at least one woman on that senior executive's list. So forcing and putting enabling structures in place. But the most fundamental shift happens when something else comes into play. And that's this thing called training awareness about our unconscious bias. Those things I talked about, this double bind, this judgment of others because of our model of what strong leadership looks like, come because of unconscious bias, our education, our experience, what we're told looks good looks like. All sorts of things mean that we judge very quickly. And I have worked for some phenomenal guys who say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do to improve the situation. I've done childcare and I've done flexible benefits and we have a mentoring program. <coughs> you go, have you had a conversation at the executive level about you, your judgment, the filter through which you see these individuals and this challenge, because if you haven't, that's the missing piece of the jigsaw, is the light bulbs going on in a room. It's a bit like Brian was saying earlier, the SML program. There are light bulbs go on. With unconscious bias training and conversation and awareness about the way in which we judge each other and the way in which we see good and the way in which we put hurdles in the way of people progressing, the light bulbs go on in the room. And I was joking with Lassa last night and saying, the one question I tend to ask CEOs who say they're serious about this is to ask them, do you have a teenage daughter? <laughs> because guys in business don't see this, but it's amazing how when the teenage daughter hits 14 or 15, they suddenly realize how the world looks through her <coughs> eyes. And I say to them, is this a culture in which you would want your teenage daughter to work and aspire to being? Do you believe she would succeed in the role if she came to work in your organ? And it's like, ping. They've got blokes, boys, teenage boys like I have. Forget it, because this is testosterone-filled, competitive, aggressive nonsense I'm living with at the moment. <laughs> and that's a gender stereotype as well. I accept it, OK. <laughs> but. 
having the conversation, bringing the awareness into the room, means they suddenly realize that there are hurdles being put in the way. They just didn't realize they were doing. Didn't, they weren't aware of it. And all these lovely left brain logical programs weren't breaking through because actually the culture still wasn't inclusive sufficiently or broad-minded enough about diversity sufficiently to change fundamentally the dynamic. And I do actually believe, because I have seen it in practice, I've seen the fundamental shift on a couple of the boards I sit on, where we've gone from no women to one women to four women. The conversation is fundamentally different. And it, it is richer, it has different perspectives in it, but it does have the polar bear effect. There is, I, I, we shouldn't have those kind of sexist views, but there is a way in which something just calms down slightly. The testosterone fueled bad behavior calms down slightly to allow space for different perspectives and different conversations to happen. In 10 years, I will tell you if it improves the financial performance of a company. Today, I don't know. And to some extent, it's immaterial. Because what it does is it's bringing a much more diverse, enriched, and fulfilling conversation around the board table, around customers and employees than I've ever heard when I've been the sole female voice at the table practicing my communication skills. <laughs> And so I just want to finish by uh, reflecting on... I've always looked for quotes about women leaders. Okay? There aren't that many that are hugely positive, which says a lot, doesn't it? You can find awfully critical ones about people like Hillary Clinton, but I found one in a surprising voice, not a voice I would have expected to have a feminist view of the world, and that's a lady called Nancy Reagan. Yeah. And what Nancy Reagan said, and what I always say to... Uh, senior executives questioning whether they should put a woman in a senior role or not is a woman is a bit like a tea bag. It's a very English analogy, isn't it? <laughs> you never know how strong she is until you put her into hot water. <laughs> <laughs> and on that point, thank you very much for your attention.